All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so today we're uh, excited to welcome uh, Professor uh, Xiaonan Guo uh, at uh, IUPUI. Um, so uh, before joining IUPUI, uh, Xiaonan was uh, a research assistant uh, or a research associate at uh, Stevens yeah. Institute of Technology. Um, he got his PhD from Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, and he's here today to talk to us about uh, um, how wearable devices can uh, reveal personal PIN numbers. Uh, so this is based on uh, work at uh, Asia um, CCS, uh, and it received a Best Paper Award. Um, yeah. So thank you. OK. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming, and thank you for the introduction. So my name is Xiao Nanguo. I'm currently a, uh, a, an assistant professor uh, of society department IOPUI. And today's talk is, uh, I would like to, the title of the talk I would like to share with you today is uh, Front and Fall, Your Wearable Device Can Reveal Your Personal PIN Number. So this, is talk, uh, this talk is basically based on the Asia CCS uh, Best Paper Award with my uh, uh, previous advisor, Professor Ying Chen, and other colleagues from uh, Stevens Institute and Technology. And this work has been uh, received media coverage from, uh, from uh, different media, CNN, Yahoo, or yeah, and that's uh, something. OK, so first of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the motivation. So nowadays, we have, uh, we have uh, facing the, the, the era that we have a lot of wearable devices. We now they have a smart watch, and we have a smartphone, and we have uh, fit, uh, Fitbit trackers, fitness trackers, and all those devices enable a broad range of applications. For example, we can track our exercises when we're doing some workout, and uh, we can use that devices to achieve some, you know, the gesture recognition and to develop some fancy application scenarios. And also, we can use that to assist the fitness for fitness purpose. So however, we find that through the variable devices, your sensitive information could be leaked in the, during the process when you're using the variable device. Either it can be your smartwatch or smartphone or your fitness tracker. So especially we focus on the scenario that imagine that you are approaching an ATM machine and you like to withdraw some money. And before that, the, fir the first thing you need to do is to enter your personal PIN number. And what, what about if you have, if you wear your smart watch on your wrist and use that hand to enter your personal PIN number, so that's the scenario in the ATM machine. And also for electronic doors, if you would like to enter some authorized authorized the only uh, area or some uh, space or some classroom or some, uh, some rooms that need to, need to enter some pin numbers through electronic door, uh, electronic door lock. And also, for the keypad control server, you need to enter some pin numbers so that you can access some services and uh, authorize some transactions. So all of these scenarios involve pin key, uh, key key-based entering during the process. And also, if you wear wearable devices, the sensitive information could be leaked. OK, let's the first review some traditional attack. So previously, for example, the adversary can uh, sense or can get obtain your personal PIN number through shoulder surfing, right? The adversary can see or just to see your PIN number and when, she, uh, when the adversary just behind you and when you enter your personal uh, PIN number on an ATM machine. And also some uh, adversary can uh, install a hidden camera, hidden camera on the ATM machine or some prefer to use the keypad overlay to put, put a fake key on top of the real keypad of the ATM. And in addition, some adversaries use ATM skimmer that when you use your real card, they can store your information when you swipe your uh, debit card. And those methods, those traditional attacks require direct visual contact to the key entry actions. And also additional installation is usually needed. For example, the hidden camera, the keypad overlay, and ATM skimmer. 
Okay, so back to the research community, there are some uh, researchers says, hey, we can use audio based and the web can uh, launch a vibration based attack. So how about we just put a smartphone besides or just uh, put uh, besides your keyboard and when you typing something, when you are typing something, so the cause the vibration the propagates through the table and uh, then the smartphone can feel, can sense the uh, can sense the vibration, and then they can use some machine learning technique to guess or to tr to get, obtain your personal PIN number or whatever you tap on the keyboard. And some uh, researchers said that uh, we can also they can also achieve the smartwatch based attack. For example, they can uh, they also uh, mentioned that so once you wear a smartwatch on the wrist on your wrist and when you're typing something and they can use some machine learning technique use training data and they use a, a, lingu a linguistic model and so those sort of things to derive your personal pin number so however those attacks do have some limitations so first of all the audio based and the uh, vibration based attack require rely on the linguistic model and label the training data. We have to collect some training data in advance. For example, we have to collect a, uh, a number, uh, a, a different uh, num uh, uh, number of times of uh, key clicks in advance to obtain a training data. And such kind of technique is sensitive to environment noise. And also for the smartwatch based attack, it's hard to deal with non-contextual input such as pins because previously they focused on the linguistic model. For example, tap some English words, English uh, vocabularies, you can infer it's based on lingu linguistic model. But for the personal pin number, it's, it's kind of like a random sequence of numbers. There's no hidden uh, relationship between uh, any two digits. So this is, uh, those, uh, those traditional attack is difficult to recover the fine grain hand movement trajectory so that they cannot recover the personal pin number without training data, without linguistic model. Oops. Okay, so our solution here is to provide a training free. There is no training phase. And the contextual free key entry inter, uh, inference system and we do not rely on any linguistic model. And without additional devices, we only rely on your smartwatch and your smartphone, and such kind of uh, solution not subject to environment noise. So that's our objective to provide such a solution. So the basic idea is that, so, so we do not have training data, we do not use training data. So our goal is to try to exploit embedded sensor in variable devices. And those embedded sensor in variable device, devices can capture the dynamic of the key entry activities. And such information, such information from the key entry activities can help us or can leverage by the adversary to derive a fine-grained hand movement trajectory of the key entry. Okay, so the intuition behind is that when the key press, when the key, uh, in the key pressing, so your hand is basically accelerates towards the key and then stops, deaccelerates when, the, when, your, when your finger touch the bottom of the key due to the force, uh, due to the re reaction of the key bottom. And then when you move, from one key to another, especially from between two consecutive key numbers. And actually, your hand is basically accelerates first and this accelerates, then stopped on top of the next key. So when you reach the position of the next key, you stop. So basically, we can see that this is the accelerometer, uh, accelerations from accelerometer when you wear a smartwatch and we can see that we can, uh, we can have the key click, the first key click, and the second click, uh, key click, and we can know there's a hand movement between the two key clicks. So that's the intuition behind our basic idea.
Okay, so then we can infer the pricing point, the releasing point, and the pricing point. So those points are essential, a basic element for us to calculate the fine grain hand movement. So why we can do that? Because nowadays the smartphone or smartwatch or fitting the trackers, they do equip or integrated the accelerometers, the gyroscope or magnetometers. So for example, the accelerometer can measure the accelerations and gyroscope can measure the orientation of the different axes of the objects. And also the magnetometer can measure the magnetic field stress. Okay, so okay, so this is the intuition behind the idea. Oh, next, I would like to say that there's some potential or that there's some possible attacking scenario. So basically, the first attacking scenario, scenario we consider is malware-based attack. So suppose that a mal we, the adversary can install a malware on the smartwatch, and then the malware can transmit the data to the remote remote adversary's phones. So this can be achieved, for example, if the adversary approaching you, so hey, I just developed a, a fitness application app, so why don't you just try it on? And you install the app, but basically it do install, it does install the sensor data, but it will send the sensor data to the remote server, probably a remote adversary's phone. And also, the adversary can also install some malware on your smartphone because sometimes your smartwatch like may send may send some data to your smartphone and uh, once your smartphone installed a malware and the malware can send the data the sensor data to the remote server belongs to the adversary and this is the first uh, attacking scenario Another attacking scenario can be the wireless sniffing attack. Because we all know that nowadays the smartwatch is paired with user's phone while Bluetooth because they would like to synchronize some data, synchronize time, and transmit some data, share some data with your devices, right? And what about if the, there's some attacker is, my, is like mine in the middle and sniffing the Bluetooth traffic? And there's, a, there's some papers talking about the blue, uh, the blue, uh, sniffing the blue, uh, Bluetooth traffic. So we can use that kind of technique to achieve these attacking scenarios. So those are the two attacking scenarios we're mainly talking about. Quick clarification question. Sure. Uh, so, uh, when traffic is sent between the you know smartwatch and uh, smartphone, um, you know is that traffic typically encrypted, uh, or is there just you know no protection against uh, you know man in the middle attackers? Yeah, the, the normally the, the data is encrypted, but uh, according to some papers, the uh, the main, uh, actually the main focus of this work is not to to achieve the, the, these two attacking scenario. So the basic idea, the main purpose of this paper is to raise public consensus. So once those attacking scenario can be achieved, so that means your sensitive data can leak through the sensor data from your wearable devices. So we refer some uh, papers from, the, uh, they claim that they achieved can uh, sniff the Bluetooth traffic. So once the data is not encrypted, in the traffic, so we can use that data to, to do that. So, sure. I was going to mention, I, I have a Fitbit, mm -hmm. and you can choose whether to have the data between the watch and the phone encrypted or not. Okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. Although the two attacking scenarios seems realistic, but in order to reconstruct the fine grain hand movement, in order so that we can uh, crack the personal PIN number and uh, it is, we have to face several challenges. The first one, how can we obtain the robust fine grain hand movement trajectory tracking, movement tracking? Because normally the user have, uh, the user uh, normally uh, consciously moving their hand or rotating their hand while enter some 
personal PIN number. And also, there's a, this, we would like to propose a training-free key entry recognition. That means we do, we do not have training data in advance. And there's no linguistic model. We do, we do not have knowledge of dictionary. And also, we'd like to recover the PIN number without contextual, uh, contextual information. And also, the sensing with the single free access variable devices. Because remember that the sensor we obtained from variable devices is defined in the variable devices coordination system. But the, 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 the pin number actually is defined in the keypad system. So we have to convert from one co coordinated system to another. So in order to achieve the coordination conversion between or among different coordination, uh, coordinated system, we leverage quaternion. So because in the key entry activities, it basically involves three coordinate system. The first one, device coordinate, your smartwatch, right? And the fixed coordinate, the word coordinate, we have a north, east, that's the word coordinate. And also we have a keypad coordinate. We have the keypad Y, we have the keypad Z axis, X, Y, Z, three axis. So we can use quaternion to achieve the coordination, coordinated system conversion. So we can basically use the, the quaternion is kind of like the mathematic represent, uh, representation of the rotation about the angle. And then we can use that to change the sensor rating in device coordinate to the sensor rating in word coordinate based on the simple equation listed here. And also the quaternion value is readily available from the Android API. So that means we can directly extract the quaternion value from the, your Android device, either in smartphone or smartwatch. So this provide us a, provide a, a very convenient way for us to convert among different coordination system. And here is the basically uh, basic uh, framework of our system. So first, we take the inputs of motion sensor ratings. So basically, it's the accelerations and the gyroscope and the quaternion data. And basically, quaternion data is the sensor fusion from accelerometer and the gyroscope. And then we perform the key click detection and trace segmentation. And then we perform data calibration by leveraging quaternion-based coordination alignment and perform noise reduction. And our framework has two main tasks. The first task is distance estimation. We divide the whole hand movement trajectory into several key clicks and the traces while trace segmentation. And for each of the segments, we use to the task to calculate the distance by, uh, uh, by pointing out the starting and ending point of the key, key entry activity and perform the distance calculation. And then the second task is the di uh, direction derivation. We use quaternion determinations technique and propose a slope-based angle calculation to derive the direction of, a, a, of one segment. And then once we get the distance and the direction of each segment, we have to concatenate all of these segments. And then we propose a backward subpass integration. That is uh, that we propose a pointwise Euclidean distance uh, accumulations technique that we can reconstruct and we can recover the uh, key sequence by using the tree-based key sequence uh, derivation. And then I will talk about this uh, in detail. So the first one is the fine grain subpass recovery. So suppose in this example, the user's uh, inputs 5, 4, 1, 9 and enter. Because by assumption that we assume the user will normally enter the enter key by the end of the pin sequence. That's, the, that's usually the case. The, the system requires you to enter the enter key. So then we have a four subpass 
subpaths and five clicks. And for each of the subpaths, we use key clicks trace segmentation that we can get four segments. And then for each of the segments, we use the distance calculation technique and uh, direction derivation uh, approach to perform the subpass recovery. And that's the whole basic idea about the fine grain subpass recovery. Okay, so the first question is how we can uh, calculate the distance. So the basic idea, so the, the, the most important parts in order to calculate the distance to recover the fine grain hand, uh, hand movement trajectory is to determine the starting and ending point. So the starting and ending point the searching is basically based on the pricing and releasing point. Remember that when, you, when your key, when your finger move from one key to another, the acceleration will exhibit unique patterns. So that means we can use that unique pattern to help us to recover the fine grain hand trajectory. So what we did here is that we uh, first look at the x-axis and y-axis, and we determine the dominant axis by calculate the local maxima and local minimum to find the, the largest the local maximum and mi the minimum, the lowest the minimum as the dominant axis. And then we can uh, determine, we can determine the starting point as the first zero crossing point between uh, before and after the unique acceleration patterns as illustrated in this figure. And finally, we can use distance, the basic distance calculation technique. We can use double integration, integration with uh, trapezoidal rules to give a approximately distance calculation. And also the next, it's once we get the distance, in order to have a whole, the whole view of the hind, uh, the hand movement trajectory, we also need to derive the direction. So we define the direction as the positive x-axis and counterclockwise, the, the angle from the uh, positive x-axis axis and counterclockwise to the path itself and then we can use arctangent to calculate the theta, to calculate the theta. But remember that the, the theta range is uh, fell uh, between uh, 0 to 90 degree. And then we can use quotient determination technique to determine which quotient the theta belongs to. And then we can convert from 0 to 90 degree to 0 to 360. So once we have this subpass, recovery and we have uh, calculated the distance between the uh, uh, distance between two consecutive keys and we have a direction of the hand movement from one key to another so can we just uh, simply naively integrate the path with the the distance and the direction the answer is no because once we uh, because once we naively integrate the path, sometimes the error will accumulate it because we have some, uh, we have uh, several segments. For each of the segments, there could be some error. And once we integrate those paths together, the error can be accumulated along the path. So for in this example, the estimated, uh, estimated uh, number as five to nine, but actually, the correct pin sequence could be, the ground truth could be 419. So that's the problem. So in order to overcome these challenges, we provide a point-wise Euclidean distance accumulation. So the basic idea is that for each of the segments, we calculate the distance between, between the ending point to any of the candidate list. So the candidate means the any keys in the keypad. For example, I use, uh, I use uh, one example to illustrate the whole process. So here is an example of the candidate sequence 8, 4, 6. For example, we have a, uh, we have a uh, 
uh, uh, several uh, segments, and we have uh, the distance and the directions. So we calculate the distance between the different candidates. So we, uh, we first show the, the candidate sequence 846. So we first put the subpath 3 because the, the last key is the enter key. So here we assume we only have four numbers. So that means we have a three subpaths. And then we can calculate the Euclidean distance as, as, uh, uh, as here, and we can calculate Euclidean distance, and then we can put the starting point of the third subpass to the candidate key, and then start calculating the second subpass from the candidate. It's different from the previous naively integration. So then we calculate subpass by calculating the Euclidean distance with the candidate key, the key four. And then we accumulate the Euclidean distance and until we reach the first subpass. So we can get the value number here. And then we calculate all the possible candidates. And for each of the candidates, we have the output. That is the value of the accumulated Euclidean distance. And then we can see that we, can only, we only need to find the minimum accumulated Euclidean distance that in, uh, the, in this example is 4, 1, is 9. And then back to the enter key. So we review the pin sequence at 419. That's the output of our system. So for uh, this work, we, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't talk about the exper uh, experimental methodology. For this work, we try three different keypads. The first one is a real ATM machine. We did conduct some experiment in a real ATM, ATM machine, and also we uh, we brought a uh, detachable ATM pad, and we conduct uh, experiments on detachable ATM pad. That's the ATM, ATM pad from a real ATM machine. And also, we conducted some experiments on the keyboard number pad, as we uh, used in the desktop over here. And also, we test the three variable devices. Two of them are smartwatch, and one is Inversense MPU 9150. And the MPU is, kind of, uh, is IMU, is Inertial Management Unit. So basically, the reason we, uh, we use these three different devices, the first, uh, uh, the first reason is that they have a, we can configure them to different sampling rate so that we can examine how the sampling rate affects our system performance. And then, because the MPU is, uh, is, is uh, widely used in nowadays wearable devices, either in your smartphone or your, in your smartwatch, and they, they, they share the similar sensor chips that have accelerometers and, and gyroscope magnetometers. And we recruited 20 volunteers to help us to collect the data. And also for all the data collection, we require them just to enter any four-digit pin sequences, either by, uh, uh, and then that means we have five key clicks. And the evaluation metric is top key success rate and the number of trials until success. And also, in addition, we develop a crack ATM, ATM pin app, app that we develop we uh, send the data, we ask uh, the smartwatch to send the data directly from the smartwatch to a uh, smartphone while Bluetooth. And then in the smartphone, we record the sensor data, including accelerometers and including the quaternions. And then we can use that to store data. And then we process the data offline to crack the personal PIN number. And in addition, we develop a uh, a MATLAB GUI that uh, show the whole process. So we have uh, on the right hand side, we have uh, input as the accelerometer ratings, and we have quaternion ratings. And then, for example, you can see that 
This is the sensor data in variable coordination system before coordination alignment. So you can see that the x, y axis is not in the horizontal line uh, uh, equal to zero acceleration. But once we use quaternion to convert the raw sensor data from variables to the word fixed coordination system, over here we can see that it perfectly aligned to the fixed, fixed coordination system. And then we can use the derived finger movement trajectory by uh, connect the several segments from the previous we have introduced the distance estimation and the direction derivation. And then we use the Euclidean point-wise the Euclidean distance calculation based on the tree-based pin sequence recovery algorithm, we show the output in the right line over here. And finally, we pro provide a list of the several candidates, the top K candidates over here. So we can see that the first, the first candidate is one, two, five, six. The second candidate is one, three, five, six. So if you are, if you are an adversary, you can try the top five or top three, because normally the system allows you to try to have three tries or five tries, and, to, and after that they can lock your lock your account. So that's the or MATLAB GUI. And then I would like to show the performance of uh, different variables. So we can see that the performance of the backward pin sequence inference with three kinds of variables on the detachable ATM pad, on the real AT, on the, uh, we only show the performance uh, on this figure, so on the detachable ATM pad, because we would like to show the, the performance of different variable devices. So basically we have uh, three uh, devices, the LG uh, W150 and work, uh, working at 200 hertz, and we have IMU working at 100 hertz, and we have Model 360 working at 25 hertz. And we can draw the conclusion that, so the higher sampling rate leads to higher success, successful rate. This implies we can uh, propose some countermeasures. For example, we can lower the sampling rate and in, uh, in, to some extent so that we can uh, lower the successful rate of the adversary. And also, on the right-hand side, we show that the adversary can break over 97% of the pin entries from the LG watch and the IMU within five tries and 90% for Moto 360. So that shows that we would like to uh, show the, the, to raise the public concern while those those figures that we have to pay attention to the viable devices, especially when you enter your personal PIN number, use the same hand that you wear your wearables on your wrist. So that's the purpose of this work. Sure. Um, so I guess quick question about sure. uh, the slide. Uh, right, so users tend not to pick uh, uniformly random PINs. Uh, you know, do you take that into account in this model, or is it possible that the attack rate would be even higher if you kind of incorporated a model of you know user selected pins? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, so uh, first of all, I have noticed that there are some uh, papers uh, talk about the user the the pin entry uh, statistic models or some model they uh, collect some data and do some analysis. So in our work, we basically ask a user to you can uh, enter whatever you want because we don't want the user to enter his real ATM pin number, but he can, uh, he can tell, he don't need to tell us and just enter the pin number. So probably the, that could be a future work. So probably we can involve the models to see whether we can improve the successful rate based on the model analysis. Okay, thanks. And also, we would like to see. Uh, I would. Uh, I would like to show that the distance, the performance, or of our distance estimation algorithm. So to show the result here, we first fix the sampling rate at 100 hertz, and we test three different distances. The first distance is 2.5 centimeters. 
and 5 centimeters and 6.4 centimeter, centimeters. So those distances are selected based on the layout of a normal ATM pad. And then we can show that for the ATM machine, attached attachable ATM pad and the keypad, uh, keyboard number pad, for all of this, all of this uh, pad, uh, key entry pad, we can achieve a very small arrows for all of this different distance, for short, for medium, and for long, are within one centimeter. That means we can achieve millimeter levels accuracy. So the arrow, the mean arrow is only in the millimeter levels. And also we can see that we, uh, the X axis, we uh, show the CDF plot about displacement uh, derivation narrow for ATM machines for three different uh, distance and detachable ATM pad and keyboard uh, and keyboard key and number pad. And we can draw the conclusion that the 80th percentile error are less than 1.5 centimeters. So finally, is our conclusion here is uh, we would like to show that the wrist wound variable device can be exploited to recover the use of fine grain head movement and we develop a pin sequence inference framework and the system is training free, uh, doesn't rely on any linguistic model and we can uh, tolerate the, the, the error accumulate, accumulated based on the different segments. And also I would like to show some future uh, research plan about this work because once we have we have shown that it is possible for the user to leak some information from your variable devices. But we would like to ask, uh, to take one step further to ask a question, whether we can explore your mobile payment pin number on your mobile phone once you wear a variable devices on that. And somebody can ask, okay, so for some system, we do have the pattern pin numbers. Can you also crack that? Or is the pattern pin number safe or not? So those can be our future research directions along this trend. Sure. I see you wear your watch on your left wrist, like I do. Yeah. Is your dominant hand your right hand? Yeah, actually my dominant hand is a red hand. Okay, so when you do a pin pad in an ATM, mm -hmm. or you do your security code on your phone, you do it with your dominant hand and you hold it with your other one. Yes. So most fitness trackers tell you not to wear the fitness tracker on your dominant hand. Mm -hmm. Because what it does is it introduces error. Mm -hmm. and makes you appear more active than you are. Yes. So have you looked at how many people actually wear their Fitbit tracker or what have you on their dominant hand? And I would propose what you may find it's a very small subset. Yeah, I understand. So that's a really good question. And uh, so, so first of all, I think most of the people will use their dominant hand to enter the pin number. And sometimes, like me, I wear my watch on the non-dominant hand over here. But we do observe that there are some people, for example, they have uh, a uh, smartphone, uh, sorry, a smart watch or a normal watch on their non-dominant hand, and then they prefer to put their fitness trackers on the dominant hand. But I think that can be a uh, countermeasure that do not, as you said, do not put the tr fitness tracker on the dominant hand. On one hand, it can introduce some errors. On the other hand, such a variant behavior can lead to a sensitive information leakage from your dominant hand. So I think that the purpose of this work is to, like the public, uh, the risk, the public concerns that do not wear uh, for, uh, for example, one suggestion could be do not wear your uh, variable, for example, smartwatch on your dominant hand, and then just to avoid use your dominant hand to enter your personal PIN number while with your variables on the same hand wrist. So that's all for today's talk, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.